so we have come to it at last. That point in time when Black Dragon Gaming really picked up, a lot of things were going on, and as such, Tommy didn't screenshot all of his requests as they came in, and if they were not made in the Forgotten Race review for the Forgotten Race review, they, in fact, did get lost. But today, by request of Mr. or Mrs. Somebody, we're cracking open Blood of the Elements and the Plane Hopper's Handbook to talk about one of the Genie-kin races, second on the channel, well, third, I always forget the Suli. Today it's the Undyne. If you have any requests for this series or any other series, throw them in the comments and I promise I'll, you know, get better at my job. Oh, by the way, ding the bell if you want to hear more sweet Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition content today. This episode of The Forgotten Race Review was brought to you in part by Josh King. Thanks for your support, man. Josh actually is going to, in the pretty far-off-ish future, GM for us on Tuesdays, so that's exciting. But it's neither here nor there. Let's hit it. Okay, so much like the Oread, the Ifrit, the Sylph, the Undyne wasn't always called an Undyne as far as tabletopping was concerned. Back in the day, way back in the day, in the Planescape sourcebook for AD&D, there was a race printed alongside the Azimar known as the Genasi. Each of the four Genasi broods, fire, earth, water, air, was its own distinct race, bred from, you know, various genie kin and things. They of course have lasted all the way through Dungeons and Dragons to present day, and we have them in Pathfinder just under a different name. As far as our water Genasi is concerned, we call them an Undyne. And of course, an Undyne is a category of imaginary elemental thing associated with water, which we first see in the alchemical writings of Paracelsus, who was a Renaissance alchemist, but of course the Greeks have been dividing the world into the four basic elements since, you know, forever and ever ago. But in Pathfinder, an Undyne is a humanoid creature, the offspring of a human, and a creature from the plane of water, typically a married genie. Their inhuman nature is obvious at a glance, their skin is tinged in shades of blue or green, a lot of them have webbed fingers and toes, fin-like ears, and their instinctive love of the water drives them from a very early age to seek out rivers, lakes, and oceans, and it's near these aquatic environments that they prefer to live. Though, of course, as one might expect, the Undyne are masterful swimmers, usually, basically, from birth. Most Undines, in fact, lack gills or the ability to breathe underwater. It's an ironic and unfortunate fact that Undines must make their homes near the water, you know, what with that strong pull to that particular element, but can never live within the substance towards which they feel this strong affinity. Most Undine settlements are built on the shore, some of which are built on docks or flotillas of boats lashed together, and of course, as you can imagine, the populations of these floating hamlets will in fact, much like the water, ebb and flow, with whole families or even whole neighborhoods just uprooting one day, unlashing themselves from the flotilla and sailing off to another settlement, or maybe even founding another one on their own. Now as far as their stats go, an Undyne comes of age at 60 years. Males range in height from 5 feet to 6'6", weighing anywhere from 130 to 220 pounds, with females coming in at 4'7 to 6'1", from 95 to 185 pounds. And the max age for said race being oh, 5 or 6 campaigns, give or take 250 plus 6 percentage dice worth of years. Now, for their character sheet, an Undyne receives a plus 2 to dexterity and wisdom, but suffers a minus 2 to strength. These guys are both perceptive and agile, but they tend to adapt rather than match force with force, or, you know, they have one of the better ability score adjustments in Pathfinder. Dexterity and wisdom are the two most important stats in the game, and if I had to dump one thing, I'd dump strength. At least if I had a dex boost and I was trying to do that agile spaghetti boy kind of thing, but yeah. Anyway, moving forward, they are native outsiders, medium creatures with a base speed of 30 feet and a swim speed of 30 feet. In addition, they may move through the water without making swim checks and always treat swim as a class skill. Remember, having that base speed also means they've got a plus eight racial bonus on swim checks should they have to roll a swim check for like swimming in a hurricane. As one might imagine, the Undyne has cold resistance five and can cast hydraulic push once a day with the caster level equaling their level. 
The Undyne has dark vision, ooh, race getting better and better, and Undyne sorcerers with the elemental water bloodline treat their charisma score as two points higher. For all sorcerer spells and class abilities, Undyne clerics with the water domain cast their water domain powers and spells at plus one caster level, but that's not all. So I told you we'd talk about the Plane Hopper's Handbook, right? Yeah. We're not gonna go in depth on them today, but this is as good a time as any to call them out as of the release of this book, and it's been out for a little while, my bad for dropping the ball. All four of the Geniekin races have two variant races to reflect different sorts of elements. We've got the Iron Soul and the Gem Soul for alternate Oriads, Lava Soul and Sun Soul for the Ifrit, Storm Soul and Smoke Soul for the Sylph, and for the Undyne that we talk about today. If you don't want to be based on water, if you'd rather be based on Vapor or Frost, the Mist Soul or Rhyme Soul is right up your alley. These are much like the blood of the XYZ books where you would see like variant Azimars, variant Tieflings, etc. But, you know, for the genie kin. And if you'd like to see them, request go in the comments. And that is basically, you know, the entire race. Though the amphibious alternate racial trait looks really good for your aquatic games where you might play an Undyne, trade out that spell-like ability for the aquatic subtype and the amphibious special quality, and boom, under the sea forever and ever and ever. Now playing one of these guys, again, they've got a really good stat adjustment. The first thing I think of off the top of my head with a buff to my dexterity and my wisdom is a monk. But that isn't to say that a plus two to two of the most important ability scores in this game doesn't look good on, you know, everybody. Particularly characters that might dump those ability scores, or at least, please don't dump your wisdom. Uh, let me just interject there on myself. PSA, Black Dragon Gaming, don't dump your wisdom moving forward. A class that might only have like that odd plus one into wisdom from the last little bit of investment that they had would have a little more racially and would have to pay less for a middle of the road wisdom than other characters which means that say like an undying fighter who doesn't really care about their wisdom but doesn't want to be mind controlled has a bit of a buff there to say nothing of the fact that remember your undying is not humanoid sort of taking the mostly human alternate racial trait in addition to being immune to, say, like, charm person, hold person, because, you know, you're not a person, you need charm monster, hold monster, as you are a native outsider. You're also immune to enlarge person, because, you know, again, not a people, uh, fantasy people. But that's super relevant in a lot of games, because low-level spell lists will just bounce off you. Buffed against the things that will come at you, immune to a lot of them as well. It's really good. Now, GMing for one, has never really come up in any of my games. I'll have an Ifrit before too long in Carrion Crown, and I've been in a party with a Sylph, though the Sylph was flavored as a changeling. It kind of plays a, basically along the same lines as jamming for the Azimar, jamming for the Tiefling, the Skinwalker, etc., etc. It sort of depends on where we are. I imagine a lot of settlements will see a blue-skinned, web-fingered, thing come into their town and scream ah, monster at the top of their lungs because small towns probably have never seen the like before and i could definitely see that being in a character's backstory or like thrown in their path as we adventure because a lot of things are not going to understand what they're looking at that said i could also feel a sort of like a call to the sea kind of thing for a character like this because right? It's in their blood. They feel that call to the water and eventually maybe even the plane of water to find whatever it was that made them what they are. And then, you know, all that aggression of the townsfolk trying to like torch and pitchfork you because you're scary. And for all they know, you're a cultist of Dagon who's taken it a little too far. And how the player reacts as the campaign goes on is, well, you know, storytelling. But that's all I have to say today. What do you guys think? Have you played an Undyne before? GM'd for one? Played in the Plane of Water? Underwater? Ruins of Aslan? Let me know all about it in the comments. As always, we'll keep that conversation running, and thank you guys for your time. Again, if you haven't done it, be sure to like and subscribe for more videos and ding that bell so you get all your Pathfinder 1st and 2nd edition content. We continue to tear down our request line next week. We're doing another variant native outsider, the Angel Kin Azamar. See you next Monday.